would like to be the kind of gardener that has a perfect garden plan, meticulously plotted out week by week what they're gonna plant when and where. But if we take a quick look at my garden planner, you'll notice that it is completely empty and I have just found myself in the middle of the summer realizing, ah, why didn't I plant my garden yet? Is it too late? As defeating as it can be to realize that we are so late in putting anything in the ground, unless we're five weeks out from snow, there's still time. So today we are going to look at a simple method that will help us to figure out what we can still plant, when, where, and how. I'm Anne of All Trades, a former city dweller turned organic farmer and woodworker and teacher. And we're sitting here in the middle of summer in my unplanted garden because a year and a half ago, my husband and I uprooted our entire lives to move across the country to Tennessee. That's made a few things chaotic, but chaos or not, we're still gonna get some veggies out of this garden. It doesn't actually matter what time of year it is. This is a way that we can use the back of a seed packet whether you are standing in the aisle at Home Depot staring at a wall of seeds or looking at a pile of seeds from other years of planting, this is a great way to use the information that's on the back of the seed packet to decide what we can plant, where, when, and if we actually still have time to do it or not. The first thing we're gonna look at on the back of the seed packet is the days to harvest. So right now, I've just Googled our last frost date and our first frost date. Our last frost date here in Nashville is April 12th, and our first frost date is on October 10th. Obviously, it being the middle of summer right now, I have missed some of the early season of planting, but we've still got 108 days until it actually frosts. Let's look here, 52 days to maturity. We can probably get two more rounds of cucumbers in. That's very exciting. And planting temperature is 75 to 85 degrees. We're well within that range. We're gonna be good to go there. And it wants full sun. So that goes in the yes pile. Now let's look at a whole bunch of other seeds and uh, determine whether we're gonna plant them. Now let's look at spinach. Spinach is one of my favorite vegetables. It only takes 30 to 40 days of harvest, so we do have time, but it wants to be planted when it's lower than 65 degrees outside. So spinach goes in the no pile for now, but we'll put it in our for fall so that we can plant it in a few weeks when temperatures start going down. Basil is ready to harvest in three to four weeks. So with 108 days, I think we can fit some basil in there. However, there's still another couple things we wanna look at. Basil wants to be planted in full sun. So in the middle of summer, this is gonna be just fine. It's gonna get plenty of that. And the ideal temperature to plant it is between 65 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So here in Nashville, we are not in any danger of going below that 65 degree temperature. It might go a little higher than the 90, but I think we're still gonna be good. So then we'll put this in the yes pile. We're still gonna have a couple other things we look at when it comes time to plant. So don't toss this. Broccoli, nope. Watermelon, yep. Artichokes, eh, debatable, but I love artichokes, so we're gonna do that. Even knowing beyond when we can plant things and where we should try to plant them, then comes the question of, how deep does each different kind of seed need to go? And how far apart do we need to spread our seeds? And how much do water are they going to need? We can make a simple tool that can help us answer those questions. This past year, my business partner, Josh Nava, and I have taught a lot of spoon carving classes, which has been great because it's taught me the inherent value of firewood beyond just burning it because it's cold outside. You can also make just about anything you want using a few simple carving techniques. And it's actually because we taught so many of those spoon carving classes that Skillshare, the sponsor of today's video, asked us to make a Skillshare Originals class about learning how to carve. When Skillshare approached me about the opportunity for them to come to the farm to film a Skillshare Originals class, I knew that Josh and I were ready to make the best course available on spoon carving. The things that we had learned through teaching so many online spoon carving classes, the way that we had learned to constantly refine and clarify the things that we were saying, having fleshed out all the physical analogies we'd need to explain a physical skill in an online format, we're honed and ready to record for this course. 
We even snuck in a whole section on how to learn anything you want, online or in books, the same way that Josh and I had learned woodworking, and we disguised it as a spoon carving lesson. In our Skillshare course, you'll learn how to pick wood for a spoon, how to create three-dimensional designs, and how to design beautiful functional items in your home. Josh and I are really proud of the Skillshare course that we created together, and I hope that you will click the link below to get a free trial to Skillshare so that you can go through our course and get access to Skillshare's entire education library, which is massive. So make sure that you don't miss out on this awesome offer. This is a very fancy stick, um, also known as a plant dibbler. And it's going to help us to know the depth that we want to plant our plants. It will help us to space our plants appropriately. And it's gonna make planting a whole lot more efficiently as well because it's going to make our holes for our seeds a whole lot faster. We've brought our brand new dibbler and our seeds that we're gonna plant out into the garden. So let's get started. The simplest recipe for a thriving and successful plant is to have some dirt to put your seed in, also known as soil, some water, and some sunlight. And we could go super in depth on each one of those topics, but for right now, we wanna get some seeds in the ground and just see what happens. Taking a look at the dirt or soil we're going to put our seeds into, we want to make sure that it's not just a hard, hard clump. We wanna make sure that it's broken up enough that the seed actually can emerge. So if all of your soil looks like this, maybe take a hoe or something to break it up a little first. You'll notice that my dibbler has some lines and numbers on it. Those are inch markings. And incidentally, this is 12 inches long. So if I'm going to plant the seeds, as it says, one inch deep, I can make my hole with my dibbler at one inch. I can stick my seed down into it, cover up that up, and then I can use it to find three feet away from that initial hole, stick it in, plant my seed, and we're good to go. Obviously the easiest way to make up for lost planting time is to start with starts. Someone else had the good sense to plant this and get it started in its growing process a lot earlier than I did. So assuming I'm not too late to actually find any starts in the nurseries and that this is a plant that actually wants to be transplanted, this is a great way to get a head start on my tomatoes. That's because they actually can start making roots from little nodes. So we're actually gonna take away all of the bottom leaves on this plant, and it's actually going to start sprouting roots here. Because established plants require a lot more water from the outset, we want to plant them deeper in the soil so that they actually have access to some of the water that hasn't evaporated off the top of the soil. So we're gonna take this and we're going to plant it very, very deep, getting those roots as far down as we possibly can, and then putting the soil here over it. This makes our tomato plant look a whole lot less impressive, but it will help it to transplant a whole lot better because all those roots are down in that soil. This is a great way to make up for lost time with plants like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, other nightshades, because they can make more roots um, deep down in the soil. However, more tender plants like cucumbers and zucchinis do not actually like to be transplanted like this. So it's actually better to start those with seeds. Thankfully, those take less time to grow to maturity than these tomato plants do. So I've planted my zucchini seeds back here. And by the time this tomato is big and tall, these zucchinis will be growing right on course along with it. And so just like seeds, if we are transplanting a plant, we wanna make sure that we give it a nice long drink and really, really hydrate that soil below. I'm gonna wait till this kind of goes down and then give it a few more tries. Then I'll grab some of the soil around it and give it a little squeeze. I want the water to drip, but not to flow out. And then I'm gonna know that that water is well hydrated and this guy's ready to go. I'm also gonna kill this little pest that's in the garden too. So as we are planning and planting our garden, we want to think about the way that not only can we make the best use of our space available, but also how we can actually plant our plants so that they will provide a pretty even shade canopy over the soil. That will help the soil to ultimately retain more moisture because it's shaded from the sun, but it will also help us to have to water our plants less. Hello, Oliver. 
fancy seeing you here. Here's another little tip about watering and planting. We want to plant our seeds and water our garden, if possible, um, in the late evening. That will save the sun pressure from being on the garden and drying out the soil. It'll give the soil all day to heat up and then have this moist environment overnight for the seed to germinate inside. And it'll also save us just time and effort because less of the water will evaporate by sun pressure during the day. We don't want it to be dusty like this because the fertility will just blow away in the wind, but we also don't want it to be soaking wet either. And one of the mistakes first time gardeners make is that they water their garden too much. In watering our garden, we want our soil to become the consistency of a moist sponge. And I say a sponge because all of the pores and everything in a sponge are really important. Plants' roots really like to breathe, and so watering it too much is going to cause them to drown, but obviously not watering it enough will cause the soil around the little seedlings to dry up and then the plant will die. Once your garden starts to look a little bit more like this, check out my video, Stop Watering Your Garden, and find a bunch of helpful tips there. I will see you in the next video. Cheers!